How you doing guys? Welcome to another video. This is topic 7, Equilibrium. This is the first one where we look at what is dynamic equilibrium. Let's go. Okay, topic 7.1, what is dynamic equilibrium? We look at what is a state of equilibrium and then we look at some of the characteristics of an equilibrium system. Now before we get stuck into this one, I'm going to show you with a couple of examples what is dynamic and static equilibrium. Roll VT. Here we have a static state equilibrium. A static state equilibrium is where something is in balance. And when it is in balance, we don't have to do anything to maintain the state. So we call that a static state equilibrium. It will remain like this until some sort of force is applied to change it from its equilibrium. A dynamic equilibrium is something that's a little bit different. In a dynamic equilibrium, I need to be doing something to maintain my steady state. So the treadmill is moving this way, and I'm going to have to be moving that way, and I'm going to have to match the speed of the treadmill to stay in equilibrium. So I'm now in equilibrium, I'm not moving, so I am in a state of equilibrium. However, I am going in the forward direction at the same rate as the treadmill is going in the reverse direction. This is the same as a dynamic equilibrium. The reaction has not ceased, it's just the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are happening at the same time. If I stop my forward movement, I will start to move backwards on the treadmill and I will no longer be in equilibrium. If I start to go too fast, I move forward and I'm no longer in equilibrium. So when the rate of the forward and reverse reactions are equal is a state of dynamic equilibrium. In a volumetric flask, I've placed some liquid bromine into the flask. To begin with, there is very little colour in the space above the liquid, but the brown-red colour of the vapour quickly darkens until the space is a uniformly dark shade. The colour change over time shows that the concentration of bromine vapour increases until a maximum concentration is reached. After this initial change, the liquid and the gaseous contents of the flask do not appear to alter their concentrations as time goes by. There will always be liquid bromine in the bottom of the flask and bromine vapour above. But the equilibrium is not static. The rate of bromine liquid turning into bromine vapour is the same as the rate of bromine vapour turning into bromine liquid. So the rates of evap evaporation and condensation are equal, which gives us what we call a dynamic equilibrium. Okay, dynamic equilibrium for a physical process. So in a closed container, just like that video, we might have some liquid bromine that we put into that evacuated or empty vessel. What happens is it forms an equilibrium with its vapour pretty much straight away. When it does, the liquid and the gas contents, they don't alter their concentrations. They appear to be the same, and in fact they are. There will always be liquid bromine and there will always be bromine vapour in the flask. Now this is described as a dynamic equilibrium because vaporization, condensation, they're occurring at the same time and at the same rate, as long as the temperature remains unchanged. And we would be able to measure that because we could see it as the colour not changing. So we say that liquid bromine is in dynamic equilibrium with its vapour and its liquid, and that can be represented by the equation. Now an equilibrium system will always have the double-headed arrow, so you've got to make sure you look for is it a single arrow, meaning a limiting excess relationship, or does it have the double-headed arrows, which means that it's an equilibrium system. So here's an example of an equilibrium system. We can prepare ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen gas and normally we would expect one mole of nitrogen plus three moles of hydrogen to form two moles of ammonia. But this is not a limiting excess reaction, it's an equilibrium system. Now an equilibrium system means that there will be reactants and products remaining after a very very long time. So in our closed system we're going to have some of the nitrogen, some of the hydrogen, and we're going to form some of the ammonia. It won't go to completion. And no matter how long we leave it, it will never form two moles of ammonia because it will be in equilibrium. 
So whenever ha we have an equilibrium system, it must be in a closed container so the reactants and the products can't escape. And in an equilibrium system, we expect there to be some of the reactants left over and some of the products left over. How much of the reactants and how much of the products we talk about in an upcoming video where we define what the K value is. The K value is the equilibrium constant and it is important for working out whether or not something is more favored to the products or more favored to the reactants. But for today, we just need to remember that an equilibrium system is one where we will have both reactants and products remaining at the end of a reaction. So in this reaction, both the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are occurring. And we can show this by using a simple graph. Now a dynamic equilibrium is where the forward and reverse reactions can occur at the same time and the system and the reactants and the products cannot escape. So if we're talking about the forward reaction, we're talking about nitrogen and hydrogen forming ammonia and the reverse reaction, we're talking about ammonia breaking down into nitrogen and hydrogen. So we started off with hydrogen and nitrogen in our container. So what happened is the forward reaction took place first as the concentration of hydrogen and nitrogen decreased, we started to form ammonia. So at the start, we had no ammonia in the flask. So there was no chance for the reverse reaction to occur. But as the nitrogen and hydrogen started to react to form ammonia, then we can have the ammonia breaking back down in a reverse reaction to form nitrogen and hydrogen. So as the concentration of H2 and N2 decreases, the NH3 is formed. Now the hydrogen, it decreased by a factor of 3x because of its stoichiometric coefficient, and the nitrogen by x because it had a stoichiometric coefficient of 1. So when we draw these graphs, we just need to be careful of those coefficients. To sum that up, the decrease in concentration is proportional to their stoichiometric coefficients. So make sure when you're drawing a graph, you check the stoichiometric coefficients. Now what's happening with the ammonia? Well, as the reaction proceeded, ammonia was formed. So the concentration of ammonia increased until a certain level where it started to flatten out. And the three gases, the concentration flattened out, and that is where we formed our equilibrium. At equilibrium, the concentration of all of the species remains constant. However, the reaction has not stopped. The reaction is still occurring, it's just occurring at the same rate. So the forward reaction is occurring just as quickly as the reversed reaction. So with the rate graph, we might be asked to draw a graph to show the rate of the reaction. Now initially, we had a large proportion of hydrogen and nitrogen, and we had no ammonia. So the rate of the forward reaction is initially very fast. As soon as we put these two things in, they're going to react to form ammonia. But as we start to form ammonia, the amount or the concentration of the reactant starts to decrease. So the rate of the forward reaction starts to decrease. As we form the ammonia, we've got more chance of it breaking down. So the rate of the reverse reaction begins to increase. After a period of time, and when it equals equilibrium, the rates of the forward and reverse re reaction will be occurring at the same rate. So those two graphs must come together and flatten out at some point. So here's another example. We can use the reversible reaction involving nitrogen dioxide, which is brown, and nitrogen tetroxide, which is colorless, and we can monitor that by using just our eyes. So the equation here is N2O4 is in equilibrium with 2NO2. One is colorless and one is brown. So suppose we inject some N2O4 into the flask, which is colorless, some brown color appears immediately, indicating that the equilibrium is forming NO2 molecules. The colour intensifies until equilibrium is reached, and then we don't see a colour change. Beyond that point, it doesn't appear that anything's happening, but the rate of both the forward reaction and reverse reaction will be occurring at the same time. The N2O4 is breaking down to form NO2, and the NO2 is re-reacting to form N2O4. It's simply that the rate is, occur is the same. 
the forward reaction is occurring just as fast as the reverse reaction, so it appears like nothing is happening. But in a dynamic equilibrium, those two things must be occurring at the same time. So here's another example. We could go about forming the equilibrium by starting with some brown NO2, and then what we would see is the brown color start to fade as it begins to form N2O4. So we might be asked to draw the graph to try and help explain the situation. So if we start off with a whole bunch of NO2, as soon as we put that into a flask, we're going to start to form some N2O4. So that concentration of NO2 is going to start to decrease. As that happens, the concentration will decrease by a factor of two. So we've got a forward, a reverse reaction occurring quickly at the start as the NO2 breaks down into N2O4. And then as the reaction proceeds, we must start to form more N2O4. So we're gonna to start to see the brown change into colorless. Now, how much does the N2O4 increase by? Well, it's gonna be half as much as the NO2 decrease by because of those stoichiometric coefficients. So when we draw our graphs, you don't need to be perfect, but just be aware of those differences in size. In terms of the rate, well initially we had just NO2, so the rate of the reverse reaction going from right to left will be very, very fast. And as we form some more NO2, it's going to start to slow down. So the reverse reaction will start off quickly and then start to flatten out as we reach equilibrium. The rate of the N2O4 reacting to form NO2, well, that was, there was none of that at the start, so that didn't have a rate. But as the reaction proceeded, we formed some NO2, so the rate will start to increase and then flatten out once we reach equilibrium. So the forward reaction initially starts off very low, but as it reaches equilibrium, those two rates must be the same. If you're looking at a graph and you need to find the point of equilibrium, that's when the concentrations are equal or the rates are equal. Okay, so another fin a final example. Another way to start the equilibrium is to start off with the colorless N2O4. And we can start off with some concentration and then we need to work out what's going to happen in this particular system. So if we start off with N2O4, it's going to react in the forward direction to produce some NO2. So we can see it there decreasing by a factor of 2 of, of X. And that means that our formation of NO2 will increase by a factor of 2X because the forward reaction will be occurring until the concentrations remain constant. That is where our equilibrium occurs. So what this graph shows us is what we would describe as a net forward reaction. The N2O4 is reacting to form 2NO2. So we describe this as being a net forward reaction to re-establish the equilibrium. So NO, N2O4 is reacting to form NO2 in a forward reaction. Okay, topic 7.1, some top tips. Remember the equilibrium arrows. If they're there, it's the double-headed ones. The reactants and the products, the concentrations remain constant at equilibrium and at dynamic equilibrium the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Thanks for watching guys, don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe for more and I'll see you next time.